Alright, yeah, and welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. This week, we're going to take a look at a subscriber deck submitted to us by Ben Packer. So, it is kind of a Naya aggro deck with a lot of exert, which is why I've called it exert aggro. It's not specifically exerting for the most part, but there are a lot of cards in there that do a lot of things. All of the big hitters there are exert creatures and do exert related things. So, let's have a look at the deck anyway, without further ado. Okay, so, uh, the basic idea of this deck is to pull out some really, really um, good value creatures. Things like Gloribound Initiate, which has some exert abilities to become a 4-4 lifelinker. Carries Ev, which constantly makes a lovely monkey to torment your opponent. On a crap captain to uh, pump up your opponent's stuff, uh, your team's stuff, should I say. And so on and so forth. Let's look at the beginning of the deck, shall we? So we're starting off with Expedite. So Expedite is a one red mana instant speed card that says target creature gains haste until the end of the turn and draw a card. So it allows itself to cantrip it. So if you want to find some more answers, you can throw this into the graveyard for no value as long as there's a creature on the field to target anyway. But ideally, you can stick it on any creature. So if we're on turn three and we get an initiate, for example, we can actually... Uh, use two of our mana on an initiate, three mana to make it hasty and swing for four on turn three, just the same as a Lath New Hellion would do, which is a lot of value there as well. So there is that. We've then got Blossoming Defense to protect our creatures. One green mana, instant speed, target creature you control gets plus two, plus two, and gains hexproof until the end of the turn. So this is protection for our creatures, but it's also that little added bit of pump spells that might allow us to push through enough damage for lethal. We then have Selfless Spirit. So Selfless Spirit is a 1 and a white 2-1 flying creature and yet again it's another way to protect our creatures but also it's a flyer in the air as well which can be quite difficult for our opponents to deal with uh, depending on the deck. So uh, it's got flying and when you sacrifice it each creature you control gets indestructible until the end of the turn. So if our opponent goes for a planar outburst to try to save themselves we sack the Selfless Spirit in order to keep our board state intact, which is one of the things that aggro struggles with a little bit. If you go through a board wipe, you are screwed. Of course, it doesn't stop things like uh, Languish and Yuheni's Expertise, because they do take your toughness down to zero, and Indestructible does not save them from that. But Radiant Flames, Planar Outburst, that kind of thing, all give Indestructible. Burn spells don't work as long as you've got a spirit on the field, so it's really good at keeping the pressure on. So we've touched upon Glorybound Initiate, it's a 3-1, but it can become a 4-4 lifelinker if you exert it, which means it doesn't untap during your next untap step. We do have ways of untapping our Initiate as well, so uh, we'll bear that in mind for the future. Carry Zev, yet again, we've kind of touched upon it. It's a 2-mana, 1 and red, 1-3 one, with First Strike and Menace, which means that it's difficult to block in the early game. Menace also means that it needs to be blocked by two or more creatures in order to block it, essentially, so... Minimum, we're usually going to get in for one damage with Carrie Zev, but then she'll also generate a 2-1 red monkey token, and that gets exiled at the end of the combat. So that can be blocked, but it can also maybe force out trades. So it is a kind of a 3-3 in a sense, but only two damage can be easily blocked. We then have Honored Crop Captain. So for red and a white, two mana total, we've got a 3-2. It's not too bad, not too bad at all, but on a crap captain attacks, other attacking creatures get plus one, plus O oh until the end of the turn. So she allows us to pump up the rest of our team when we're swinging in with hasty damage. We've got tramplers in Voltate Brawler swinging over the top with some flyers, that kind of thing. Pumping up all of our stuff allows us to get some really easy turn four, turn five wins. So she is pretty sweet. Voltaic Brawler is next with a red and a green for a 3-2. When it enters the battlefield, you get two energy, and you can spend one of that energy when it attacks, and if you do, it gets plus one, plus one, and gains Trample until the end of the turn. So on turn three, it can be swinging as a 4-3 Trampler, which gets past most blockers in the early game. Um, but that energy can also be used to keep a uh, Lath New Hellion on the board for an extra turn as well, so something to bear in mind. But we can also use it... For Harness Lightning. Harness Lightning is a 1 and a red instant speed. Choose target creature and then you get 3 energy and you may pay any amount of energy to deal that much damage to that creature. So bare minimum this is a 2 mana 3 damage burn spell. But as we mentioned Voltate Brawler you don't have to use the energy. 
So that could turn Harness Lightning into a 5 damage burn spell on turn 3, which is essentially a Lightning Axe without the discard. So there's so much value there in the Harness Lightning if you set it up correctly. We then have High Spire Infusion. So for one and a green, instant speed, target creature gets plus three, plus three until the end of the turn, and you get two energy. So this is good for the creatures that our opponent can't block. Our carry Zebs, for example, can become uh, four damage with Menace, which means that they probably aren't blocked in the first place, so we can get a fair bit more damage through that way. We also get two energy as well, so it combos quite nicely with the Laugh New Hellion, which allows us to pay for its end step sacrifice upkeep cost, essentially. So that is another way to do that. Ride down is a bit of removal slash extra pressure as well. So red and a white instant speed destroy target blocking creature. So if our opponent manages to find a way to block our carry Zev, or maybe we're running in with a Laugh New Hellion on our first turn and they have something to block it, we can use ride down to kill that blocking creature and then any creature that was blocked by that creature gains trample as well. So suddenly it's actually a trampler, so if it was double blocked then we can trample over the top of that one creature. But if it was just single blocked then it's like it was never blocked at all, essentially, which is pretty sweet. I do love me some ride down. So Lath New Hellion is a 3 mana, 2 and a red, 4-4 four, four with haste. And when it enters the battlefield it gains 2 energy, and at the beginning of our end step you have to sacrifice it unless you pay two energy. So it has um, the energy required on its own to hit for eight unblocked, if that is the case. But we also have plenty of ways, as we mentioned, to generate two energy to keep it around so it keeps hitting for four. It is very good at surprising your opponent, being that it is a hasty creature. Some of them don't see it coming, which is a lot of fun that way. Then have Arncorp Crasher. So for two and a red, a three two with haste. So yet again, another surprise creature out of nowhere can help us uh, win the game. Uh, if our opponent maybe has one single blocker in the way, Arncrop Crusher does a lot of work. So you may exit Arncrop Crusher as it attacks, and if you do, target creature cannot block this turn. So your opponent's only blocker suddenly can't stop the rest of your stuff coming through with your Honor Crop Captains pumping everything up and all that kind of thing. There's so much value here if you can set it up, and of course it is a surprise attacker as well, which might just be able to close out the game if your opponent's not expecting a haste creature. Next we've got Ronas the Indomitable. So for two and a green, we've got a 5-5 legendary creature god with death touch and indestructible. Ronas the Indomitable cannot attack or block unless you control another creature with power four or greater. That is its downside, although its upside allows us to bypass that. So if we've got maybe a Lath New Hellion on the field, then Ronas can come in. If we've got a Tylus Tracker that we've just stuck a counter on, then we can get in with our Ronas, that kind of thing. Voltaic Brawler, unfortunately, is a little bit of a number because it has to um, it has to actually get the plus one, plus one on combat, which means you can't attack in prior to the Ronas, unfortunately. But you can pay two and a green to give another target creature plus two, plus O, and trample. So that pretty much gives every single creature in our entire deck the ability to give Ronas uh, a chance at attacking, which is a lot of fun. So that is a three mana, give something plus two, plus O, and trample, and allows you to get in with a death touching five, five. Anything that's gonna block a death toucher is going to die, essentially. And indestructible means there's pretty much no downside to attacking in with him whatsoever as well. Survives, languishes, survives, board wipes. He's really hard to deal with. We've then got Tireless Tracker. So for two and a green, three, two. Whenever a land enters the battlefield and you control, you get to investigate. And that means we get a clue token onto the battlefield. And the clue token allows us to pay two, sacrifice it, and draw a card. So it is card advantage in the Tireless Tracker. We want to be playing this about turn four. So that when we play the Tireless Tracker, we can drop our land and at least get some value off of it before it dies. But we could also combo that with um, an Expedite maybe as well to make use of that extra mana that we're not spending to give it haste so it can still swing in for that three. So there are certain ways that we can still deal a bit of damage with a tracker on turn four. Whenever you sacrifice a clue, it also gets plus one, plus one as well. So it gets a chance to be completely out of hand. And once we've got that counter on, it allows Ronas to attack in. 
and we can also do a lot of stuff with the extra damage of course. Eros' champion is next, this can win a game completely out of nowhere. So for one, a red and a white, three mana total, we've got a 2-2 two -two with double strike. So a double strike essentially means that it deals double damage, it attacks twice in a nutshell. So it attacks um, two with first strike damage, killing anything, and then two with anything else. Um, if we give it an extra bit of pump, so we give it high spire infusion, for example, making it a 5-5, five five, suddenly Eros' champion is a three mana hitting for 10, which can just kill your opponent in one shot, depending on how well the game is going for you. A lot of the time, it's going quite well. We then have Glorybringer. Glorybringer is a great way of getting out um, an extra little bit of damage. Yet again, another surprise attack. It's kind of a little um, slogan of this deck. Surprise attack. Uh, with haste, it is a 4-4 flyer, which makes it difficult to block. And when you attack as well, you get to exert it. And when you exert it, it deals 4 damage to target non-dragon creature and opponent controls, which can clear the way for maybe an Eroasis Champion. Alongside a Crasher, you could deal four damage to a creature, killing that. And Crop Crasher, maybe stopping a bigger creature from blocking. So suddenly you've got two blockers out the way and you're hasting through a lot of damage. So uh, Glorybringer can win you a game out of nowhere in the right circumstance. We then have Samut, Voice of Descent. So for three, a red and a green, we have a three, four, flash, double strike, vigilance, haste creature that gives other creatures haste that we control of course so all of our non-hasty non-surprising creatures all of a sudden get to swing in with their own little bit of surprise and we can also use this to untap creatures if we've been exerting them as well and also it's got flash which means we can cast it on our opponent's end step if they've maybe attacked him with everything left no blockers behind we flash in a samu and we're hitting for six with the double strike it also has vigilance so it can be held back as a blocker. Stupid value with Samu. And works really well with Exert creatures because we can use her to untap stuff as well. We then have Prepare to Fight. So Prepare is a 1 and a white instant speed. Untap target creature, it gets plus 2, plus 2 and gains lifelink until the end of the turn. So if we've exerted a Glorybringer last turn, then it means it's probably tapped. We can use Prepare to make it a 6-6 six, six lifelinker that also gets to swing in and exert itself again to deal 4 damage to another creature. It essentially allows us to reuse any exert triggers we want. You can also use it to untap a Samu, but you know, we'll probably want to be using it on an exerted creature to use its ability again. Finally, we've got... Oh no, sorry. On the other side, we've got Fight. 3 and a green, Sorcery. It's got Aftermath, which means you cast it from your graveyard. And when you do that, you exile it. Target creature you control fights target creature and opponent controls. So, essentially, fight a creature. Um, for the most part, it's not going to be too much value, but if we use it on something like a Ronas who has Death Touch, then it's guaranteed to kill anything as long as it doesn't have Indestructible or Hexproof. So, depending on the situation, we can kill our opponent's creatures with a fight. Not really used it too much in this game. It's mostly here for the prepare anyway to untap our exerted creatures. But the fight's there just in case. Finally, we've got Insult to Injury. Insult is a 2 and a red sorcery speed. It says damage cannot be prevented this turn. So it completely shuts down all fogs. And means that you're going to be dealing a fair bit of damage. Why are you going to be de for dealing a fair bit of damage? Because if a source you control would deal damage this turn, it deals double that damage instead. So suddenly, Samu's hitting for 12. Uh, Glorybringer's hitting for 8. And Erosis champions are hitting for four without ever being pumped up by anything as well. If we look at the other side as well, because once we've cast Insult, Injury goes into our graveyard. This also has Aftermath, so we can cast it from our graveyard. Injury deals two damage to target creature and two damage to target player. So if we have cast Insult on the same turn, that also deals four damage to target creature and four damage to target player. So we can start pushing through an extra bit of damage. Getting rid of our opponent's blockers, allowing our other creatures to get in for an alpha strike and maybe winning. That's essentially the deck. Let's go on to the mana base, shall we? It's pretty simple. We've got two plains, four mountains, and two forests. It's kind of the nice skew with the deck. Uh, we've got a lot of jewels in this deck as well, so it's not too important with the skew because we have a lot of doubles of everything. Like Needle Spires. Needle Spires is a one... 
drop, well, I say it's one drop, we've got a one copy of it, enters the battlefield tapped, which is not ideal. However, it does tap for red and a white, and we can use it as a extra creature past a board wipe, for example. So for two, a red and a white, Needle Spires becomes a 2-1 red and white elemental creature token with double strike, so it hits for four and can kill any four toughness creatures. But we want this to essentially keep the pressure on the board once our opponents wiped it, perhaps. They've got no creatures themselves, we swing in for four, maybe that might be lethal. We then have Cinderglade, so this is a mountain forest, enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands, though we've got lots of basics. Good chance it comes into play untapped, but we also have um, the ability to put these into play on turn one as a tap land, which is perfectly acceptable as well. Canopy Vista is the same, except for it is a forest and a plains. Rootbound Crag is a buddy land, so it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a mountain or a forest. As you can tell, these are forests, these are mountain and forest, so if we play this on turn one, Rootbound Crag will come into play untapped on turn two, so that's two dual lands in two turns, um, ready to go on turn two, it's pretty sweet. And similar to the Rootbound Crag, we've got Clifftop Retreat, which is a mountain or a plains, and Sun Petal Grove, which is a forest or a plains. We then have Hanware Battlements. So this is a colourless land, but it does allow us to... It's a utility land, essentially, as far as we're concerned. We pay a red, we tap it down, we can give a creature haste until the end of the turn. Yet again, using our creatures as surprise attackers is pretty much the battle plan of this deck. Uh, the secondary ability is largely useless, we'll never do it, unfortunately. But if we did, it would allow us to make this bad boy, which I've only made a few times in my Magic Jewels career. But there you go. Then we've got Ether Hubs, two copies of this. Enter the battlefield tapped, you gain some energy. We can use that with a Harness Lightning. We can use that maybe to keep a Lath New Hellion alive. We do need two for that. Or we could use it maybe to pump up our Voltaic Brawlers. Ideally, we just want this here as a five color land, essentially. So on its own, it adds colorless to the mana pool, but you can also tap it, pay energy, and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So this just really allows us to smooth out our mana and make sure that we're casting things on time. Finally, we've got two copies of Evolving Wilds. So, Evolving Wilds, you can sacrifice it, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and shuffle your library. Yet again, smoothing out our lands, so we get to choose whatever land we want. It also is a second trigger for Tireless Tracker, so it enters the battlefield, we gain a clue. We sack it to find a basic, we gain another clue. So, there's a lot of synergy for that as well. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it for the deck. If you did enjoy the look of the deck, then... Be sure to check out the matches that should be following shortly after. I should mention this is also a deck that we played on stream as well. So you should check out the VODs if you want to watch um, some serious gameplay for that. It's the reason why I'm playing it for the most part is because it was doing some stupid things on stream. So I highly recommend checking that out if you are interested in watching the VODs for this week. Alright guys, like and subscribe and don't forget to hit that little bell icon right next to the subscription button and that will give you notifications when I release new videos. Do hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you.